Welcome to my channel. Welcome back to my channel. Let's touch on a few noteworthy moments from voice talent and members of my VO workshop. Jessica Mars booked not one, but two national spots. One for Chubb, proud insurance partner of the U.S. Open, and another national spot for Golf Channel, promoting the 2023 Solheim Cup. And I'll put links to both of those projects uh, below in the video description. Congratulations, Jessica. Mark Harrietha booked a cool Netflix promo for Stranger Things Season 5 through Trailer Voice Artists. Again, I'll put a link to that project down below. Congratulations, Mark. Very cool. <laughs> Evelyn McCauley was invited to be a guest speaker at the upcoming Celebrating Authors Free Summit next month, where she'll be discussing everything from the business side of writing to self-publishing in print and audiobooks. And the link, again, in the video description. Congratulations, Evelyn. And Tim Evans celebrates his seventh season as the announcer for the Without Warning podcast with renowned private investigator Sheila Wisaki. And Tim also shares with me that this is the most active he's ever been in his VO career. Nice. In November of 2020, I started something with the uh, voice talent in my VO workshop, which was uh, basically to assign homework. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it actually turned out to be more fun than you might think. So it's a monthly project uh, that I call the VO Monthly Challenge or the Monthly VO Challenge. Something like that. You get the idea. Every month, it's a different theme, a different genre that they're invited to participate in. And sometimes the parameters of the assignment are, are well prescribed. And other times, it's a little more open. Uh, this month's suggestion for the VO challenge comes from Andrani Kellisar, who suggested, let's, let's record children's stories or children's books, which is something we haven't done before. I was really impressed with this suggestion because I thought, oh, that's that's a that's a common one. I, why, it's been it's been nearly three years, and I hadn't thought of that. So thank you, Indrani, for that suggestion. So, uh, voice talent in my VO workshop were invited to submit a recording from from one to three minutes of of any children's story. And, and I left it fairly open. I gave some suggestions, but I thought if, if you want to come up with your own children's story, uh, whether it's something widely known or maybe it's something kind of personal, maybe it's an original story, as long as it applies to uh, children. Uh, I thought, OK, let's do this. And uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because I have a thought to share with you. Well, uh, you're, you're about to see a bunch of different examples. If this sounds interesting to you, Message me. Once you take a single class with me, I invite you to join my private LinkedIn group and become a member of, of the voice talent in my VO workshop. And as you become a member, I send you one email a month. And in that email is the invitation to participate in the monthly VO challenge, like you're about to see here. In random order, here are the submissions for the VO challenge of September 2023. Thursday. Dear First Grade Journal, Yesterday was my first day of school. It is new here. Today, my teacher handed out these journals. He's making us write in these dumb things. I don't even know what to write. My teacher has muscles and a mustache. His name is Mr. Scary. He made that up, I believe. I'm not even scared of him. Hardly. From Junie B., First Grader. I put down my pencil and I looked at what I wrote. I did a sigh. <sighs> I would like to go home now, I said just to myself. Shh, said a girl named May. I'm still trying to do my work. May sits next to me in the back of the room. I do not actually care for that girl. Just then, my teacher stood up at his desk. His mustache smiled real friendly. Okay, boys and girls, you can stop writing now, he said, as I told you earlier. We will be working in our journals quite often this year. In fact, it won't be long before your journal starts feeling like an old friend. I rolled my eyes at the ceiling. What kind of old friend looks like a dumb notebook, I said. Shh, said May again. You shouldn't talk while the teacher is talking, Junie Jones. I looked at her real annoyed. B, I said. My name is Junie B. I think I have mentioned that to you before, May. I leaned closer to her face. 
B, 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 I said. After that, I slumped in my seat, and I put my head on my desk. I peeked at the other children who sit near me. Their names are Herb, and Lenny, and Jose. I do not know them from a hole in the ground. I did another sigh. <sighs> First grade is not what it's cracked up to be. Back at the inn, Joe Puffin served up bowls of his special carrot soup. Oh, that there's delicious, said Uncle Tooth. Now, how are we going to catch this here ghost? A thief always returns to the scene of the crime, you know. Ooh, do ghosts return too? Otto asked. Ah, well, we'll see, said Uncle Tooth. We need something to lure it into our trap. Ooh, I know, Otto said. My trumpet. Ah, good thinking there, Otto, said his uncle. Now, here's what we're gonna do. That night, Otto put his trumpet on the street outside the inn. The trumpet shone in the moonlight. Then Otto crawled inside a barrel. Uncle Tooth hid in a doorway, and Captain Poop Deck crouched behind the bar at the inn. And Joe Puffin flew up to the roof with a fishnet. Midnight came and went. Otto crept out of the barrel and peeked around the corner and saw a giant shadow. Was it the ghost? No, it was Uncle Tooth. Shh, Uncle Tooth whispered. The ghost is a-coming. Otto held his breath. The ghost bent down and picked up the shiny silver trumpet. Now, yelled Uncle Tooth. Then he and Otto raced around the corner. Captain Poop Deck turned on the lights in the inn. The puffin flew from the roof and dropped the fishnet over the ghost. The ghost slipped free of the net. It ran down a dark alley. Everyone chased it. Then it disappeared. Uncle Tooth scratched his head. Well, if that don't beat all, he said, maybe this uh, thief really is a ghost. Oh, look, cried Otto, and he pointed to an open manhole in the street. Otto stuck his lantern down the manhole. He saw something. It was bobbing up and down in the water. Otto climbed down a ladder and fished it out with his sword. Ah, pirate's hat, cried Uncle Tooth. Yeah, this here looks like old Black Eye Doodle's hat there to me. <whistles> Didn't Black Eye drown at sea? asked Joe Puffin. Ah, that he did, said Uncle Tooth, but it'd be just like him to come back from the dead to haunt us. Oh, and now he has my trumpet, said Otto sadly. Yeah, we'll get it back for you. Tomorrow, we'll visit Widow Mole at Dead Man's Landing. She used to work for Black Eye. Maybe she can give us some clues. But now, let's get some sleep as I'm as tired as an old boot. On the Night You Were Born by Nancy Tillman On the night you were born, the moon smiled with such wonder that the stars peeked in to see you, and the night wind whispered, Life will never be the same. Because there had never been anyone like you, ever, in the world. So enchanted with you were the wind and the rain that they whispered the sound of your wonderful name. The sound of your name is a magical one. Let's say it out loud before we go on. It sailed through the farmland, high on the breeze, over the ocean, and through the trees, until everyone heard it, and everyone knew, of the one and only ever, you. Not once had there been such eyes, such a nose, such silly, wiggly, wonderful toes. In fact, I think I'll count to three, so you can wiggle your toes for me. One, two, three. When the polar bears heard, they danced until dawn. From faraway places, the geese flew home. The moon stayed up until morning next day, and none of the ladybugs flew away. So whenever you doubt just how special you are, and you wonder who loves you, how much and how far, listen for geese honking high in the sky. They're singing a song to remember you by. Or notice the bears asleep at the zoo. It's because they've been dancing all night for you. 
or drift off to sleep to the sound of the wind, listen closely. It's whispering your name again. If the moon stays up until morning one day, or a ladybug lands and decides to stay, or a little bird sits at your window a while, it's because they're all hoping to see you smile. For never before in story or rhyme, not even once upon a time, has the world ever known a you, my friend, and it never will, not ever again. Heaven blew every trumpet and played every horn on the wonderful, marvelous night you were born. Once there were four children, whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And it has been told in another book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe how they had a remarkable adventure. They had opened the door of a magic wardrobe and found themselves in quite a different world from ours. And in that different world, they had become kings and queens in a country called Narnia. While they were in Narnia, they seemed to reign for years and years. But when they came back through the door and found themselves in England again, it all seemed to have taken no time at all. At any rate, no one noticed that they had ever been away, and they never told anyone except one very wise grown-up. That had all happened a year ago, and now all four of them were sitting on a seat at a railway station with trunks and play boxes piled up round them. They were, in fact, on their way back to school. This is more like it, said Beatty as he bedded down for the night. But there still seems to be something missing. So down the hill he trotted again and brought back, of all things, a flashlight. But as soon as he settled down, he knew there was something more a bear needed to be truly happy. What good is a light without something to read, said Beatty. The evening papers, indeed. Now, what more could a bear ask for? Well, after reading all the papers, Beatty began to worry and wonder. Maybe it's some toys I need. At this very moment, he heard a loud noise outside. It's a bear, said Beatty. I must be brave. This is probably his cave. The noise grew louder and louder as Beatty moved along, ever so slowly and shakily. Suddenly, he came to a stop, and over he toppled. Kerplop! Who's there? cried Beatty, upside down. It's me, there. I'm looking for my bear. But from inside the cave, now came not a sound. Beatty was much too embarrassed lying there on the ground. Well, hello, Beatty boy. I thought I'd find you in this place. That's why I brought along a key, just in case. For goodness sake, Beatty, don't you know you need a key? And me? Yes, but if I need you, who do you need? I need Beatty. One day in class, Duncan went to take out his crayons and found a stack of letters with his name on them. Hey, Duncan, it's me, Red Crayon. We need to talk. You make me work harder than any of the other crayons. All year long, I wear myself out coloring fire engines, apples, strawberries, and everything else that's red. I even work on holidays. I have to color all the Santas at Christmas and all the hearts on Valentine's Day. I need a rest. Your overworked friend, Red Crayon. Dear Duncan, as Green Crayon, I am writing for two reasons. One is to say that I like my workloads of crocodiles, trees, dinosaurs, and frogs. I have no problems and wish to congratulate you on a very successful Coloring Things Green career so far. The second reason I write is for my friends, Yellow Crayon and Orange Crayon, who are no longer speaking to each other. Both crayons feel they should be the color of the sun. Please settle this soon because they're driving the rest of us crazy. Your happy friend, Green Crayon. Dear Duncan, 
I'm tired of being called light brown or dark tan. Because I am neither. I am beige and I am proud. I'm also tired of being second place to Mr. Brown Crayon. It's not fair that Brown gets all the bears, ponies, and puppies, while the only things I get are turkey dinners, if I'm lucky, and wheat. And let's be honest, when was the last time you saw a kid excited about coloring wheat? Your beige friend, Beige Crayon. (laughs) Happy Go Ducky. Written by Jackie Urbanovic. Max was happy. Too happy. He stared at the sky with a strange grin on his face. Smell the flowers, he said. Feel the breeze. What's with him? asked Coco. Rock, spring fever, said Bibi. Rock, today's the first day of spring. Coco waved a paw in front of Max. He didn't blink. Will he be like this all day? Coco asked. Rock, all day, said Bibi. Coco and Bibi went inside. Irene came out. I'm leaving for the day, Max. You're in charge, okay? No, okay, said Max in a dreamy voice. Irene told Max what to do. Mail, plant, sweep, scrub, dishes, trash, grass, kittens. As soon as Irene left, Max got started. Coco looked out the window. Baby, she said, why is Max sweeping the grass? Max dragged the hose inside. Sweep the grass, he said. Water the floor. Rock. Oh, no, said Bibi. It's Irene's day away. Guess who she left in charge? Max turned on the hose. <laughs> <laughs> yelled Coco and Bebe. She grabbed the hose and shut it off. Max wandered away. Ah, What do we do? cried Bebe. We have to undo everything Max does, Coco said. Starting with this mess. Meanwhile, Max was busy. Take out the dishes, he said. Put away the trash. Mail the salad. Toss the letters. Plant the wandry. Hang the seeds. Coco and Bibi ran around all day, fixing Max's mix-ups. What's Max up to now? Asked Coco. Bibi peeked in the kitchen window. Rock! He has some potatoes, said Bibi. Rock! I think he's trying to feed the potatoes the kitten's food. Feed the potatoes, said Coco. Coco and Bibi got the giggles. They rolled around on the grass. How to Catch a Bookworm Allow me to introduce myself. I am what is called a bookworm. Books are what make me happy. I dive right in, wiggle and squirm. So many books to choose from, it's hard to decide what to pick. Adventure? Love. Learning? Think fast, it's time to move quick. Now I bet you think that I nibble that the pages are there for feeding. They're tasty, sure, but that's not it. I'm crazy about books for reading. Uh Uh-oh, one of those kids saw me. Time to jump and wriggle. I'm sure this book will be funny. And I love to smile and giggle. How do you make a tissue dance? You put a little boogie in it. That book was funny. Now I want more. There isn't a moment to sit. Father knows the best jokes. Here's a big secret about me. Something I think you should know. Every book I jump into feeds me. From my top to my bottom, I grow. Oh, big dump trucks and diggers, that is for sure my next nosedive. Construction, come on, that's cool. I wonder if they'll let me drive. Guess what a front loader does? That's what I really wanted to learn. Hey, this ride feels really bumpy. Whoa, that was a twist, now a turn. This bookshelf is all new. With its book packed in snug, 
I see where I'm heading now. I think it's time for a hug. Ah, it's morning and time for more fun. And can you find it? Book? Oh, wow! She has a pretty backpack. I wonder where we're going. It seems great books can move you. I'm in a brand new place right now. I found everything in that last book. Now, off to search for my next wow. This is the one I know it for sure. The subject is a favorite of mine. I'm heading in, starting page one. Think I'll creep in at the spine. I don't know what I was expecting. I screamed so loud that I'm dizzy. A roaring T-Rex is very scary. I need a quiet book to keep me busy. This book has so many words, and it tells me what they mean. This could take me quite some time. It might be the best book I've ever seen. I could spend a long time with this book, and then there's much more to explore. Can't wait to see you next time, because it's books we all adore. It wasn't Dixie's first day at the animal shelter. The cold cement floor felt sadly familiar, and the wadded-up blanket in the corner wasn't much comfort. The shelter was a nice place, and the volunteers gave Dixie lots of love and attention. But Dixie knew she deserved more. She needed a good home, this time with someone who would take better care of her. The shelter was noisy with dogs barking and carrying on all day long. But Dixie wasn't the barking kind. Instead, she would sit quietly, wildly wag her tail, and give a look only Dixie could. One afternoon, a lady came to visit the shelter. She had seen Dixie's picture online and was anxious to meet her. The lady at the shelter told Mama she thought Dixie was a pointer mixed with some other kind of dog. But she didn't know for sure. Dixie's whole body was speckled with a hundred brown, gray, and black spots. Thick black eyeliner framed her big brown eyes. One side of her face was a caramel color, and the other was white. Even her eyelashes were white on one side and dark on the other. Dixie was so soft that even her ears felt like silk. The lady sat on the floor, gave Dixie a big hug, scratched her belly, and kissed her on top of her head. You're a sweet little thing, the lady grinned. The sound of her voice made Dixie like her right away. Pick me, pick me, Dixie thought. As kind as everyone was at the shelter, she wanted a real home with someone special who would love her, and she could love them right back. Hey there, baby girl, how would you like to come home with me? It was Dixie's lucky day. Adorned with a brand new collar and matching leash, Dixie excitedly followed the nice lady to her car, hoping this time she was going to her forever home. Dixie's new mom bought her a comfy bed, her very own food and water bowls, treats, and stuffed toys. Her favorite was a big yellow taco. She loved the taco so much that Mama had to keep sewing up all the holes. Dixie's toys were fun to play with, but there were no substitute for real live friends. It would take a little time for Mama and Dixie to get to know each other. But both of them were hopeful all would go well. And it did. Dixie loved everything about her new life, especially her new home. There were lots of trees, colorful bushes, and bright orange flowers. It was a big, beautiful fenced-in yard where she could run, play, and explore. Every day, Mama would go out with Dixie to the backyard for playtime. Dixie would chase the frisbee, flip it in the air, toss it up again, and then do zoomies around the big pine tree. Everyone has things that belong only to them that are very special. Jordan had many things that she loved, but her absolute favorite thing was something she treasured more than the music box her granny gave her last year for her fourth birthday. Even more than her pink princess dress that she wore when she played dress up. The thing that was most special to Jordan was her moon. She knew it was hers because not only did it come to her house every night to watch over her through her window, it even followed her on those nights when she would go anywhere with her parents in the car. She felt luckier than anyone she knew to have something so wonderful all her own. One afternoon when Jordan came home from school, her mom was waiting at the door to share some exciting news. 
Jordan's dad got a new job near her granny, who lived in another city. That meant she could go see granny often, and she could have her granny's super delicious chocolate chip cookies anytime she wanted. It also meant moving to a new house. Jordan's mom told her that soon people would be coming to take all their belongings to their new house. Jordan was excited and hoped that she would like the new house just as much. Her mom assured her that she would have all her favorite things there with her and it would feel just like home in no time. On the morning that the family was leaving, Jordan helped the movers by showing them all her things so that they would not forget anything. She had said goodbye to her friends and everyone in her class, and she was looking forward to making new friends. The only thing she was sad about was that she was about to leave, and her moon was nowhere to be found. What if it wasn't her moon at all? If it was really her moon, wouldn't it be here by now? It must have known that they were moving. It had to have seen all those boxes being packed up every night as it sat outside her window. So why didn't it show up to go with Jordan? Jordan's mom called to her. Please come down now, sweetheart. We have to leave or we'll miss the plane. Granny will even be at the airport waiting for us. Jordan knew she had to go. And sadly, she thought that the one thing that was so special to her would not be hers anymore. Sure enough, Granny was at the airport and she even brought cookies. That helped Jordan forget about her moon for a while. Jordan and her mom, dad, and granny spent the rest of the day working very hard at getting their new house ready for their things to arrive. After they had done as much as they could, Jordan's dad looked at the time and told Jordan to go to her new room and get some sleep. He told her that tomorrow she would get to meet the kids in the new neighborhood. Jordan wanted to do that, so she didn't even ask to stay up for five more minutes like usual. Jordan settled into her sleeping bag and turned off the lamp when she spotted the most amazing thing outside her window. She couldn't believe her eyes. It was her moon. It had followed her to watch over her like it had so many nights before. It really was her moon. Jordan was home. I wish the McCready would hurry up and take all these people away, said Susan presently. I'm getting horribly cramped. And what a filthy smell of camphor, said Edmund. I expect the pockets of these coats are full of it, said Susan, to keep away the moths. There's something sticking into my back, said Peter. And isn't it cold, said Susan. Now that you mention it, it is cold, said Peter. And hang it all, it's wet too. What's the matter with this place? I'm sitting on something wet. It's getting wetter every minute. He struggled to his feet. Let's get out, said Edmund. They've gone. Oh, said Susan suddenly, and everyone asked her what was the matter. I'm sitting against a tree, said Susan, and look, it's getting light over there. By Jove, you're right, said Peter, and look there, and there, it's trees all round and this wet stuff is snow. Why, I do believe we've got into Lucy's wood after all. And now there was no mistaking it, and all four children stood blinking in the daylight of a winter day. Behind them were coats hanging on pegs. In front of them were snow-covered trees. Peter turned at once to Lucy. I apologize for not believing you, he said. I'm sorry. Will you shake hands? Of course, said Lucy, and did. Oh, said Susan, stamping her feet. It's pretty cold. What about putting on some of these coats? They're not ours, said Peter doubtfully. I am sure nobody would mind, said Susan. It isn't as if we wanted to take them out of the house. We shan't take them even out of the wardrobe. I never thought of that, Sue, said Peter. Of course, now you put it that way, I see. No one could say you had bagged a coat as long as you leave it in the wardrobe where you found it. And I suppose this whole country is in the wardrobe. They immediately carried out Susan's very sensible plan. The coats were rather too big for them, so that they came down to their heels and looked more like royal robes than coats when they had put them on but they all felt a good deal warmer and each thought the others looked better in their new get-up and more suitable to the landscape. 
We can pretend we are Arctic explorers, said Lucy. This is going to be exciting enough without pretending, said Peter, as he began leading the way forward into the forest. The sunrise is golden and lovely. The birds chirp and twitter and tweet. You woke me and asked for some breakfast. So why the f*** won't you eat? The bunnies are munching on carrots. The lambs nibble grasses and bleat. I know you're too hungry to reason with, but you have to f***ing eat. Your cute little tummy is rumbling, and pancakes are your favorite treat. I'm kind of surprised that you suddenly hate them. That's bullshit. Stop lying and eat. The giraffes pluck the tender leaves up. The mice snack on seeds and on wheat. No, sweetheart, I can't make spaghetti. The f***ing meal's served. Time to eat. If we were both pandas, I'd know what to feed you. But seafood is scary. We're leery of meat. Half the food at the market is probably toxic. But f*** it, you still have to eat. You're not finished, and no, you can't go to school in pajamas, a hat, and bare feet. Whatever, put shoes on and bring me your plate. My whole diet's the sh** you won't eat. The sloth and the lemur, the chipmunk and cheetah, the slow and the sleek and the fleet. Share one thing, my love, they make less of a mess than you f***ing do when they eat. How was school, hun? Whoa, your lunchbox is full. How are you not passed out in the street? How is it you're smart? How the hell are you growing when you basically don't f***ing eat? You know who loves dinner? The duck-billed platypus. But I know I'm facing defeat. This spoon-feeding sh** makes me wonder why the f*** we weaned you from the teat. I know it's super special to go to a restaurant. Hey, get back in your seat. You sh** me? This whole menu's crap to you, but a roll on the floor? That you'll eat? Mmm, this looks great. Five big bites, my darling. Fine, three, but don't try to cheat. A lot of kids don't get asparagus. Show some f***ing respect for them. Eat! Oh, now you're hungry. Tough sh**. Kitchen's closed. Have some more milk. For me, a scotch. Neat. Pancakes? Yeah, right. It's bedtime, child. It's too late now to eat. Okay, one pancake and that's it. You're exhausting and I'm f***ing beat. And tomorrow we've got to rise as early as roosters to fight more about what to eat. I'm pretty sure that you're malnourished and scurvied. My failure's complete. But on the bright side, maybe this is the night you'll go the f*** to sleep. The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle In the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and, pop, out of the egg came a tiny and hungry caterpillar. He started to look for some food. On Monday, he ate through one apple, but he was still hungry. On Tuesday, he ate through two pears, but he was still hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums, <laughs> but he was still hungry. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries, but he was still hungry. On Friday, he ate through five oranges. <laughs> but he was still hungry. On Saturday, he ate through one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of sweet cheese, one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of sherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. That night, he had a stomach ache. 
The next day was Sunday again. The caterpillar ate through one nice green leaf. And after that, he felt much better. Now, he wasn't hungry anymore. And he wasn't a little caterpillar anymore. He was a big, fat caterpillar. He built a small house called a cocoon around himself. He stayed inside for more than two weeks. Then he nibbled a hole through the cocoon, pushed his way out, and he was a beautiful butterfly. The end. It was at this point that the first thing of all, the rather peculiar thing that led to so many other much more peculiar things, happened to him. For suddenly, just behind him, James heard a rustling of leaves, and he turned around and saw an old man in a crazy dark green suit emerging from the bushes. He was a very small old man, but he had a huge bald head and a face that was covered all over with bristly black whiskers. He stopped when he was about three yards away, and he stood there leaning on his stick and staring hard at James. When he spoke, his voice was very slow and creaky. Come closer to me, little boy, he said, beckoning to James with a finger. Come right up close to me and I will show you something wonderful. James was too frightened to move. The old man hobbled a step or two nearer, and then he put a hand into the pocket of his jacket and took out a small white paper bag. You see this? he whispered, waving the bag gently to and fro in front of James's face. You know what this is, my dear? You know what's inside this little bag? Then he came nearer still, leaning forward and pushing his face so close to James that James could feel breath blowing on his cheeks. The breath smelled musty and stale and slightly mildewed, like air in an old cellar. Take a look, my dear, he said, opening the bag and tilting it toward James. Inside it, James could see a mass of tiny green things that looked like little stones or crystals, each one about the size of a grain of rice. They were extraordinarily beautiful, and there was a strange brightness about them, a sort of luminous quality that made them glow and sparkle in the most wonderful way. Listen to them, the old man whispered. Listen to them move. James stared into the bag, and sure enough, there was a faint rustling sound coming up from inside it. And then he noticed that all the thousands of little green things were slowly, very, very slowly, stirring about and moving over each other as though they were alive. There's more power and magic in those things in there than in all the rest of the world put together, the old man said softly. But, but what are they? James murmured, finding his voice at last. Where do they come from? Yertle the Turtle. On a faraway island of Solomon San, Yertle the Turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm. There was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were, until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne head that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could just sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king, I'd be ruler of all to see. So, Yertle the turtle, king, lifted his hand, and Yertle the turtle, king, gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on another's back, and he piled them up on a nine-turtle stack. 
and then Yertle climbed up. He sat down on the pile. What a wonderful view! He could see most a mile. All mine, Yertle cried. Oh, the things I now rule. I'm king of a cow. I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house. And what's more beyond that, I'm king of the mulberry bush and a car. I'm Yertle the turtle. How marvelous me, for I'm the ruler of all to see. And all through that morning, he sat there up high, saying over and over, A great king am I, until long about noon. Then he heard a faint sigh. What's that? snapped the king. And he looked down the stack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac, just a part of his throne. And his plain little turtle looked up and said, Beg your pardon, King Yertle. I've pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must I stand here? Your Majesty, please. Once upon a time, there were four little kittens. Their names were Buzz, Fuzz, Suzz, and Agamemnon. Their mother's name was Samantha. She taught her four little kittens to say, please. She taught them to say, thank you. She taught them their purring lessons. And she taught them always to wash behind their ears. On mom's birthday, Fuzz brought in the catnip birthday cake she had made with a candle from each kitten. Samantha was so happy. After the birthday supper, she said, you were all such extra good kittens, even Agamemnon, because he had had the hardest time to be extra good. He was the youngest. Sometimes he forgot. That night, the four little kittens kissed their mother and she thanked them again for their birthday presents and for being so very good too. But when she tucked Agamemnon into bed, Samantha remembered he was the youngest, tried the hardest. So she gave him an extra kiss on the tip of his nose. Are You My Mother by P.D. Eastman A mother bird sat on her egg. The egg jumped. Uh-oh, said the mother bird. My baby will be here. He'll want to eat. I must get something for my baby bird to eat. I'll be back. So away she went. The egg jumped. And out came the baby bird. Where is my mother? He looked for her. I will go and look for her. So away he went. Down. Out of the tree he went. The baby bird could not fly, but he could walk. I will go and find my mother. He did not know what his mother looked like. He went right by her and did not see her. He came to a kitten. Are you my mother? The kitten just looked. It did not say a thing. The kitten was not his mother, so he went on. Then he came to a hen. Are you my mother? Nope, said the hen. The kitten was not his mother. The hen was not his mother. So the baby bird went on. I have to find my mother, but where is she? Where could she be? Then... He came to a dog. Are you my mother? Ruff. I'm not your mother. I'm a dog. Ruff. The kitten was not his mother. The hen was not his mother. The dog was not his mother either. So the baby bird went on. Now he came to a cow. Are you my mother? <laughs> How could I be your mother? I'm a cow. The baby bird did not stop. He saw a boat. There she is. He called to the boat, but the boat did not stop. He looked way, way up. He saw a big plane. Here I am, mother. But the plane did not stop. The plane went on. Did he have a mother? I did have a mother. I know I did. I have to find her. Now the baby bird did not walk. He ran. Just then the baby bird saw a big thing. This must be his mother. There she is. There's my mother. He ran right up to it. Mother, mother, here I am, mother, he said to the big thing. 
but the big thing just said, snort. Oh, you're not my mother. You are a snort. I have to get out of here. The snort, it went way, way up. And up, up, up went the baby bird. Just then, the snort came to a stop. Where am I? I want my mother. Then something happened. The snort put that baby bird right back in the tree. The baby bird was home. The mother bird came back to the tree. Do you know who I am? She said to her baby. Yes, I know who you are. You are not a kitten. You are not a hen. You are not a dog. You are not a cow. You are not a boat or a plane or a snort. You are a bird and you are my mother. Here is A Leaf from Heaven by Hans Christian Andersen. High up in the clear, pure air flew an angel with a flower plucked from the garden of heaven. As he was kissing the flower, a very little leaf fell from it and sunk down into the soft earth in the middle of a wood. It immediately took root, sprouted, and sent out shoots among the other plants. What a ridiculous little shoot, said one. No one will recognize it, not even the thistle, nor the stinging nettle. It must be a kind of garden plant said another. And so they sneered and despised the plant as a thing from a garden. Where are you coming? said the tall thistles whose leaves were all armed with thorns. It is stupid nonsense to allow yourself to suit out this way. We are not here to support you. Winter came, and the plant was covered with snow, but the snow glittered over it as if it had sunshine beneath as well as above. When spring came, the plant appeared in full bloom, a more beautiful object than any other plant in the forest. And now, the professor of botany presented himself, one who could explain his knowledge in black and white. He examined and tested the plant, but it did not belong to his system of botany, nor could he possibly find out what class it did belong. It must be some degenerate species, said he. I do not know it, and it's not mentioned in any system. Not, Not known, known to any, any system, system, repeated the thistles and nettles. The large trees, which grew round it, saw the plant and heard the remarks, but they said not a word, either good or bad, which is the wisest plan for those who are ignorant. Thelma the Unicorn by Aaron Blabby Thelma felt a little sad. In fact, she felt forlorn. You see, she wished with all her heart to be a unicorn. Her best friend's name was Otis. He liked her quite a lot. He said, you're perfect as you are. But Thelma said, I'm not. And that was when she saw it, a carrot on the ground. It gave her such a great idea. She squealed and jumped around. She took that simple carrot and tied it to her nose. I'll say I'm a unicorn. It might just work. Who knows? Well, as she did, a truck drove by. The driver rubbed his eyes. Good grief! Is that a unicorn? He shrieked in great surprise. As Thelma watched the swerving truck, it very nearly hit her. Would you believe that truck was filled with nice pink paint and glitter? Oh, Thelma looked amazing. She was a unicorn. I'm special now, she cried out loud. And so a star was born. All across the whole wide world, her fans would cheer her name. Thelma loved it every bit. The fame, the fame, the fame. Thelma was a superstar. Her dreams had all come true. But soon she found that so much fame was kind of tricky too. You see, her fans were mad for her. They'd scream and cry and laugh. They chased her everywhere she went to get her autograph. In fact, they chased her all day long. It never, ever stopped. They chased her while she exercised. They chased her while she shopped. Please don't chase me anymore, she asked the screaming crowd. We'll chase you all we want, they said. We're fans, so it's allowed. And some were not her fans at all. No, some were really mean. And some just did the meanest thing she's really ever seen. So one dark night, she felt quite sad, this famous little pony. She said, I thought I'd feel great, but all I feel is lonely. And so with that, she changed her mind, this lonely unicorn. She cleaned off all her sparkles, and then she walked right past the crowd. They didn't even notice. 
She thought how nice that it would be to see her lovely Otis. And when he asked about her trip beneath their favorite tree, she simply said, Oh, it was fun, but I'd rather just be me. Fox in Socks by Dr. Seuss. Read by Tony T. Netto. Take it slowly. This book is dangerous. Fox, socks. Box, knocks. Knocks in box. Fox in socks. Knocks on fox in socks in box. Socks on knocks and knocks in box. Fox in socks on box on knocks. Chicks with bricks come, chicks with blocks come, chicks with bricks and blocks and clocks come. Look, sir, look, sir, Mr. Knox, sir. Let's do tricks with bricks and blocks, sir. Let's do tricks with chicks and clocks, sir. First, I'll make a quick trick brick stack. Then I'll make a quick trick block stack. You can make a quick trick chick stack. You can make a quick trick clock stack. And here's a new trick, Mr. Knox. Socks on chicks and chicks on fox. Fox on clocks on bricks and blocks, bricks and blocks on knocks on box. Now we come to ticks and tocks, sir. Try to say this, Mr. Knox, sir. Clocks on fox tick, clocks on knocks tock. Sick sick bricks tick, sick sick chicks tock. Please, sir, I don't like this trick, sir. My tongue isn't quick or slick, sir. I get all those ticks and clocks, sir, mixed up with the chicks and tocks, sir. I can't do it, Mr. Fox, sir. I'm so sorry, Mr. Knox, sir. Here's an easy game to play. Here's an easy thing to say. New socks, two socks. Who socks? Sue socks. Who sews who socks? Sue sews Sue socks. Who sees who sew? Who's new socks, sir? You see Sue sew Sue's new socks, sir. That's not easy, Mr. Fox, sir. Who comes? Crow comes. Slow Joe Crow comes. Who sews crow's clothes? Sue sews crow's clothes. Slow Joe Crow sews whose clothes? Sue's clothes. Sue sews socks of fox in socks now. Slow Joe Crow sews knocks in box now. Sue sews rose on Slow Joe Crow's clothes. Fox sews hose on Slow Joe Crow's nose. Hose goes. Rose grows. Nose hose goes some. Crow's rose grows some. Mr. Fox, I hate this game, sir. This game makes my tongue quite lame, sir. Mr. Knox, sir, what a shame, sir. That's all we have for today, kids. Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown Narrated by Shannon Johnson In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon, and a picture of the cow jumping over the moon. And there were three little bears sitting on chairs, and two little kittens, and a pair of mittens, and a little toy house, and a young mouse, and a comb, and a brush, and a bowl full of mush, and a quiet old lady who was whispering, Good night, room. Good night, moon. Good night, cow jumping over the moon. Good night, light and the red balloon. Good night, bears. Good night, chairs. Good night, kittens. And good night, mittens. Good night, clocks. And good night, socks. Good night, little house. And good night, mouse. Good night, comb, and good night, brush. Good night, nobody. Good night, mush. And good night to the old lady whispering, hush. Good night, stars. Good night, air. Good night, noises everywhere.